tragic link to a suicide pact at the Kayama blowhole. Jail for the housekeeper who stole Susan Renouf's jewels. And Australia wraps up the one-day cricket series against South Africa. Good evening. The tragic story behind the deaths of two girls at the Kayama blowhole yesterday is beginning to emerge tonight. Both were related to the seven people swept into the sea at the tourist spot five years ago. It's believed they took their lives because they could no longer deal with their grief. For the second time in five years, the same family mourns the loss of loved ones. In a bizarre twist, cousins aged 16 and 20 yesterday drowned at the Kayama blowhole, the scene of an even bigger family tragedy in 1992. We do not know, no one knows for what this, their decision was, but they went to Kayama. That was the place they've lost an uncle and three cousins. In the accident five years ago, a total of seven people died, four adults and three children. They were sightseeing when a large wave swept them off a rock platform. That tragedy has haunted the families so much, it's suspected the ongoing grief may have driven the girls to their deaths. The two girls were disturbed for what has been through this family before. The pair was last seen at school on Wednesday morning. Their school bags were recovered yesterday at the blowhole. The police are investigating the incident and uh, we're unable to make any further comment until the investigation is complete. It's understood police have recovered a note left by one of the girls, but the details haven't been disclosed. Like the 1992 tragedy, in the end it will be left to the coroner to determine why and how the cousins died. Damien Ryan, National 9 News. A teenager was charged today over the hit and run deaths of an elderly couple last night at Alawar in Sydney South. He was arrested at a panel beaters where his car was being repaired. The son of the dead couple rang his family in China this morning to tell them of the tragedy. 74-year-old Xiao Lu and his 72-year-old wife Choi Ling Zhu died instantly when they were hit by a car outside their son's Alawa home last night. They'd been holidaying in Australia. We always told them how to cross the street here. Witnesses claim the driver left the scene without stopping. How the accident happened to them, we still can't imagine that. Police say they found the car involved this morning after it was left at a Hurstville car repair workshop. They claim they have a large amount of scientific evidence to link the vehicle to the incident. They later arrested an 18-year-old man who came to collect the vehicle. He was later charged with numerous offences, including failing to stop at an accident and was bailed to appear in court later this month. Darren Curtis, National 9 News. The Prime Minister says the government will legislate to make parliamentary entitlements rot-proof. Mr Howard made the promise as controversial Queensland Senator Mel Colston rested in a Brisbane hospital. Just after sunset last night, two cars sped away from Mel Colston's home. Not long afterwards, the senator at the centre of the storm over alleged rorting of allowances was admitted to Brisbane's Wesley Hospital. Senator Colston uh, is uh, rested comfortably during the night. The hospital won't reveal what's wrong with Senator Colston. His family said earlier in the week he had flu but he's also a diabetic, suffers from high blood pressure and has a history of heart trouble. The Prime Minister clearly thinks the travel allowance scandal is a factor in his illness. Well, I'm sure he's been under a lot of strain. I don't know if it's stress or not, it's a medical problem. Dawn Colston refuses to discuss her husband's condition. How is he today? I don't think I'm going to talk about Matthew. Meanwhile, Senate President Margaret Reid returned to Canberra to take charge of the growing upper house crisis after cutting short an overseas trip. I think he probably should step down as Deputy President at the present time. That would seem to be the right thing to do. Later, after getting advice from Senate clerk Harry Evans, she decided not to recall the Senate early to deal with the affair. Mr Howard revealed the government is planning legislation soon to prevent future abuse of parliamentary entitlements. I am quite serious about devising a system that is as wrought proof as possible. The Prime Minister also promised that in the event of any MP or Senator being convicted of fraud against the Commonwealth and jailed for a year or more, their entire government superannuation contributions would be seized. In Senator Colston's case, that would be worth about $900,000, a thought that won't do much to help his recovery. Laurie Oakes, National 9 News. Fate has dealt a good hand to an Australian pilot who had to ditch his light plane today in the sea off Hawaii. With another pilot, James Branch had been flying to the American mainland. Luckily, they were quickly rescued. 
A US Coast Guard plane found Australian pilot James Branch and his American flying partner about 40 kilometres off the island of Hawaii. There he is. The men were spotted floating in a life raft, having spent two hours drifting in the water. A radio was dropped to the pair, who then told rescuers they were not seriously injured. The two men were forced to ditch their small Piper Navajo after one of the engines died. They had just a minute to jump into a life raft before the plane sank. After being winched on board the rescue helicopter, Branch, seen here on the right, and his fellow pilot were in good spirits, even joking with their rescuers. In fact, Branch's main concern was that he had lost his Australian passport. Oh, I'll have to get another one. Uh, go to the Australian consulate and get another one. It shouldn't take very long. The pair were attempting to ferry the aircraft on the long flight from Hawaii to California when the engine cut out. I was talking to uh, Honolulu Center, which is a radar facility based in Honolulu, uh -huh. and uh, I was talking to them for a good 20 minutes uh, during the entire descent to the water. Branch and his partner are counting their blessings, misfortune struck early into the trip and in daylight. What could have been a difficult search at sea was instead a routine rescue. In the United States, Mark Burroughs, National 9 News. Also in the United States, police are searching for an Australian woman over the murder of a Sydney hairdresser. 37-year-old Carmel Sanger from Five Dock was shot dead in her San Francisco salon last month. Police have issued arrest warrants for a man they believe committed the murder and Australian Amber Tyler who drove the getaway car. They are not commenting on a motive for the killing. The NRMA is planning to go into the used car business in a move which existing dealers say could force hundreds of them to close. The motoring organisation wants to build the biggest car lot in Australia with the emphasis on friendly service. This is the model for the NRMA's ambitious plans, the US supercar yard, some of them so vast that golf buggies are used to transport buyers down the endless rows of vehicles. I think it's the concept that they're more of a buying experience. The super yards have thousands of cars but very few salespeople. Customers use touchscreen computers to find the car of their dreams. You would then have the opportunity of seeing a range of vehicles and quite a large range of vehicles without any hassle on prices. There would be a fixed price. And everything's under the one roof. Insurance and finance done on the spot, plus an NRMA guarantee. It's only taken the suggestion of an American-style supercar yard to send a cold shiver through the local industry, so much so that the Motor Trades Association is now threatening to put a very large spoke in the NRMA's wheel. It's beginning an intensive lobbying campaign to set public opinion against the NRMA. They say it'll cost thousands of jobs and dramatically limit choice and affect dealers' profits. You can imagine any small used car yard near where they intend to locate such an, uh, a, a facility will survive, lucky if it's a week after that. Peter Harvey, National 9 News. The once trusted housekeeper who stole nearly a million dollars worth of jewellery from Lady Susan Renouf has been jailed for at least 18 months. Lynn Metcalf has been stealing from the socialite for more than a decade. Lynn Metcalf says working for Lady Renouf was like life in an Aladdin's cave. Her boss's lifestyle so extravagant she'd leave her diamonds and sapphires scattered throughout the house. Her collection so extraordinary, Metcalf thought she'd barely notice a few missing baubles. To an average mortal like you and I who don't have a lot of jewellery worth millions of dollars, it might be seen to be uh, too much of a temptation. Lady Renouf said she did notice some pieces of jewellery had gone missing over the years, but it all happened so slowly she thought she was going mad. The maid's 11-year deception was discovered only by accident late last year, when Lady Renouf saw another woman wearing her jewellery. Within days, police had their suspect. Metcalf claimed she never made much money out of the jewellery, but it had helped to put her two sons through school at Pittwater House. After her sentence was delivered today, she told her lawyer she had just one message for Susan Renouf the woman she once regarded as her closest friend. She is truly, truly sorry. Deborah Cornwall, National 9 News. A Supreme Court judge has accused Sydney newspaper columnist and broadcaster Mike Gibson of trying to pervert the course of justice. The attack follows an article in the Daily Telegraph about convicted murderer Kevin Crump. Justice Peter McInerney describing Mr Gibson as completely and utterly ignorant of the rule of law. 
In the news ahead, getting our soldiers out from behind their desks and the drunken railway inspector who fell under a train. A man wanted over four murders in New South Wales will be extradited to Sydney on Monday. Lindsay Rose appeared in an Adelaide court today. He was arrested after his picture was recognised on the TV news earlier this week. Police were conducting a nationwide hunt when they got the tip off. He's been charged with the 1994 murders of two Gladesville massage parlour workers and the 1984 killing of a couple at Hoxton Park. In Perth today, more than a thousand people attended the funeral of Kira Glennon, believed to be the third victim of a serial killer. Kira's family placed her ballet shoes and graduation photo on her coffin. Her father delivered an emotional eulogy. When my heart and soul feel as if they can take no more, bear no more anguish, I think of you in your bridesmaid's dress, made by mum, but never worn. The 27-year-old's body was found last week in scrubland, 50 kilometres north of Perth. A rail inspector who was sacked after turning up to work drunk and falling under a train wants his job back. Today he put his case before the Transport Appeals Board. When John Kavanagh arrived for work at Lidcombe Station last November, he was rolling drunk, literally. Caught on security video, he tumbled off the platform and into the path of an oncoming train. With a split second to spare, he managed to slide under the first carriage, a move that saved his life, but not his job. Mr Kavanagh, who held the sensitive job of making safety checks on rail equipment, was sacked. He said before the start of his shift, he'd been drinking rum at the local pub. He claims he went to the station only to ring in sick, not to work. The 45-year-old did not survive the ordeal unscathed. While passengers were cleared off the train, he crawled out from under the carriage. X-rays later revealed he'd broken a leg. He said the incident almost wrecked his marriage, but he continued to hit the bottle for another five months. He told the board his last drink was only six weeks ago. Mr Kavanagh admitted he couldn't guarantee he'd given up alcohol for good, although he was keen to put his heavy drinking days behind him. He promised if he won his job back, he'd even submit to random alcohol tests at work. A decision is expected next week. Christine Spatiri, National 9 News. Police have released a photo image of a man wanted for questioning over the rape of bus driver Sue Benson at Canterbury in February. The mother of two went public yesterday after claiming she'd been threatened with a sack by state transit if she spoke out. Police say the suspect is around 35 years old and of Pacific Islander appearance. The federal government has announced a major overhaul of the Defence Forces to get more resources into combat units. It will save nearly a billion dollars a year and involve the shedding or relocation of nearly 8,000 jobs. The blueprint for change will push Australia's military into the sharp end of defence, moving people out of desk jobs and into frontline roles. We need to ensure that those of us who wear the uniform do jobs that only people in uniform can do and get the ma maximum combat effect the massive shake-up will save $770 million a year, but it will cost thousands of jobs. More than 3,000 civilians and 4,700 military positions will go, although some will be redeployed. Around 170 top brass will be cut and 13,000 positions reviewed. Savings that are realised will be used to enhance training, to modernise and strengthen the combat capabilities of the Australian Defence Force. The efficiency drive will also see Navy, Army and Air Force resources joined, the sell-off of major assets like the Fairbairn and Richmond Air Force bases and better pay for officers to encourage them to stay in the Defence Force. The Minister says the overhaul will streamline Australia's Defence Force and insists there'll be no cut to the budget, but the opposition claims the government has ignored strategy for economics. And what seems to have come out of this is an overriding commitment to find money rather than defend Australia. The Defence Association agrees. Fleur Bitcoin, National 9 News. After more than three decades in power, Zaire's President Mobutu is on the verge of being ousted. Rebel forces now control half the African nation after capturing the second largest city. 
They've given Mobutu an ultimatum to resign within three days or they'll march on the capital, Kinshasa. France and the United States are also calling on him to step down. On the stock market, the All Ordinaries lost 12.4. A dollar up against the US currency, down against the yen and the pound. Peter Overton was sport next and the Bevan Steve War partnership simply unforgettable. Just when all seemed lost, the pair saved the day for Australia. The highlights next, and American John Houston eagles his way to the front of the Masters. <laughs> A brilliant maiden century by Michael Bevan has helped Australia win the one-day series against South Africa. Chasing a mammoth 284, Bevan's 103 and 89 from Steve Waugh helped give Australia an unbeatable lead in the best of seven series. After winning the toss, everything fell South Africa's way from Healy's grass chance to Gibbs clearing the turf. And that's gone straight over cover. Cronje continued the big hitting. That's gone miles. His stand with Cullinan worth 149. Well, the Their dismissals a false dawn for Australia as Pollock eclipsed oh, our bowlers. High and handsome and six runs. Back from injury, Mark Waugh faced air, two balls before returning the way he came. So Blewett and Law Standing followed at three for 58. No, Getting due off grass gave the Australians enough rope to hang themselves. But Steve Waugh and Bevan formed their own lynch party. Help that away and he does. Brilliant batting snuffed out the South African gaps. hopes of saving there the series. Their 189 run stand, a fourth wicket record. This is going to go all the way, it's a six. Bevan's hundred, his first for Australia in any form of cricket. There it is, and that is a magnificent century. Bevan fell for 103 off just 95 balls. War also trapped for 89, leading Healy and Gilchrist to guide Australia home. The standing captain almost repeating his effort that won the second test. Healy wins his second game in a month for Australia with the same shot. Uh, there's one better position to be in than we were this morning, and that's 4-2 uh, up, and uh, I can't be happier. Andrew McKinlay, National 9 News. A final hole eagle has given American John Houston the outright lead after the opening round of the US Masters. He's won ahead of Paul Stankowski while Tiger Wood zoomed into fourth with a brilliant back nine. Stuart Appleby is the best of the Australians. Steve Elkington, Greg Norman and Robert Allenby have plenty of work to do. Norman's nightmare began virtually in the same place it did last year. It's happening a lot here today. In the space of three holes, he dropped four shots. Those bogeys sapped the Sharks' confidence. Bogey for Norman. In contrast, Tiger Woods soared. Four over on the front nine, he ripped the back nine apart, picking up four birdies and an eagle. Oh, <laughs> birdie. Off the tee today, Woods averaged 334 yards. The next closest was 314. His putting was solid too. The shot of the day belonged to American John Houston, taking the lead with this eagle at the 18th. Well pleased with himself was the best performed Australian, Stuart Appleby. Not quite enough. At his Masters debut, Appleby remained calm to stay level with the card. 72 is not a bad start, and looking at the scores, it's pretty easy to shoot 75 or worse. The great Gary player was taking no chances the with the super bunker. slick greens. Sprinting the market and make sure that the ball doesn't trickle down the slope. But the man Jack Nicholas once said will fill a wardrobe full of green jackets stole the show today. Tiger Woods is the man to watch over the final three rounds of the Masters here at Augusta. Ken Sutcliffe, National 9 News, Augusta, Georgia. Racing is at Ramwick tomorrow where Octagonal has his last race and John Tapp expects he should win, though with stiff opposition from Intergaze. But Tappy's best bet is in race two, number one, Trader Vic. A congestion of football at Moore Park tonight, where Sydney plays its first home game of the AFL season against Melbourne at the SCG. Next door at the stadium, the Super League Tri-Series gets underway with the clash between New South Wales and Queensland. The division in the game has opened opportunities, where players have to get to know each other quickly. I know it's going to be the hardest game that I've ever played in my life, and I'm just hoping I can play up to that occasion. Coach Tim Sheens will...